think we'll get started now. Um, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I know how to advance my slides. Let's see. It's interesting. Okay, we'll do it this way. Um, just a, a little introduction about who I am. Uh, my name is Jeremy Fink. I'm going to be talking about hydraulics in hydrodynamic separators and filters today. Uh, I've been with Hydro International for almost 20 years, most of it in product development. This is how you can get in touch with me. I'll put this up again at the end of the presentation so you can uh, get my contact information. But um, th there's a lot of information in this presentation. I'm going to be going fairly quickly. Uh, it's going to be recorded so you can uh, download uh, the recording and play it back. If you have any questions, you can contact me as well. Just generally what I'm going to be going over in, in this presentation, I'll, I'll give um, just a couple of slides, introduction to Hydro International, a little bit about what we do. Um, then I'm going to launch into a description of some real basic hydraulics. And for those of you who do this day in and day out, this will be uh, old hat for you. For those of you who maybe did it in school, it'll 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 be uh, familiar, but um, maybe a little bit of a refresher. Some of you may have never seen this before in your life, and so this is just a way to get everybody kind of on the same page. Then I'm going to talk about how drainage manuals, uh, guidance manuals in different states and cities and different countries use these hydraulics basics to apply uh, to the design of stormwater drainage systems. I'll talk a little bit about how uh, manufactured BMPs, such as hydrodynamic separators and filters, are characterized hydraulically. Uh, the difference between online and offline separators and filters, um, and, and just, just uh, generally, separators and filters operate differently hydraulically. So what is the difference between these two things? And then I'll, I'll give some conclusions about um, just uh, some thoughts for t to you take away with you. At Hydro International, our specialty is water management, and um, we serve several different uh, market areas. We have a, a whole line of products that market that serve the stormwater market, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today primarily. But we have another range of products that serve the wastewater market, primarily in wastewater treatment plant headworks and uh, a range of products that are about flood control and CSO discharge. So you can go to our website and uh, find out more information about any of these different product lines here. We do all of our own um, product development in-house. We have a hydraulics lab in-house where I work and uh, we're able to do testing and research and development on these products there. Hydro International is, is truly an international company. I work here out of the Portland, Maine office, but we have on the West Coast an office um, uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, the company is headquartered in England and there's several offices in England, but also offices in France, Dubai, Shanghai, Brisbane, Australia, um, all over, installations uh, globally. To give you an idea of what we do. The stormwater treatment systems that Hydro provides treat a whole different range of pollutants. Um, anything from very, very coarse, gross pollutant removal uh, that would be screened out, this is the Hydro dry screen, to very, very fine dissolved and um, clay-sized particles that you might want to use uh, an LID type system, like um, this is our Stormscape system. But primarily in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about these three in the middle. These are our hydrodynamic separators, the first defense, the downstream defender, uh, and then our upflow filter is kind of the 
the name for our family of filter products that have uh, a range of different filtration medias and, and membranes. Um, but I'll be using, you, you know, this is this is our product line. I'll be using some some other uh, systems that you may have encountered as examples as well. So why do we talk about hydraulics and head loss through um, hydrodynamic separators? Uh, many of you may be um, design uh, drainage design engineers or regulators, and you're thinking about your drainage system as it's installed and what this hydraulic gray line looks like. And it's shown here as this red line. Um, the hydraulic grade line is the sort of the, the water level of the of the of the pressure of the pipe essentially, and I'm going to get into some real detail about what that means. But um, those of you who are who, who do this regularly know that calculating the head loss as flow goes into and out of structures is the bread and butter of being able to predict where that hydraulic grade line ends up. If your hydraulic grade line ends up too high above the actual grade of the site, you get this unfortunate uh, occurrence, which is manhole covers popping off. So that's, you know, people really understandably want to know what's going on in the systems that they install in their drainage network. And um, often these uh, systems, these treatment systems, are treated a little bit like a black box. You know, you know, you, you may do your calculations. Usually the calculations are done from downstream to upstream. And so you do your hydraulic grade line calculations downstream and figure out what you what you have. And then you want to know the resulting water level upstream. But something is going on in this hydrodynamic separator or filter that um, is slightly obscured sometimes. And, and I'll admit, um, manufacturers come sometimes keep that information a little close to the vest. Um, my hope in this presentation is to open up this black box a little bit, explain what's going on under the hood, give you some tools so that you can ask meaningful questions to the manufacturers that you work with. Um, and when they report back information to you, you can understand it in a, with a different level of, of, uh, of specificity. So I'm gonna start with a, a survey. Um, this is partly some good marketing information for Hydro, but it's also a great way for me to understand the uh, audience that I'm speaking to today. When you are trying to estimate upstream water levels uh, for a manufactured system, how do you usually do it? Do you use a manufacturer? And I'm going to go in to describe all these things, but I'm, I'm curious to know where people are. Uh, do you use a manufacturer supplied K value? Do you use a manufacturer supplied head discharge table? Maybe you just send the design to the manufacturer and they calculate and report those water levels upstream. Maybe there's another method that I'm not listing here. And it's possible that you're joining um, this presentation and this is not something that you deal with all the time and you don't know what I'm talking about. So I'm interested in that too. I'm going to launch this poll and we'll see, uh, we'll see what people say here. I'll give this just a couple of minutes. Votes are still coming in, about 70% voted. Give it another four, three or four seconds. 
Okay, I don't know if I close this poll, I don't want to lose this information. Um, and I don't remember exactly how this works, but about 30% of you said that the manufacturer supplies a head discharge table. Uh, another 17% said you use a supplied K value. About 20% just has the manufacturer deal with it. Another 17% use some other method and another 17% are, uh, are, are, are not really clued into what this is all about. So this is the really good information. It's a, it's a, it's a widespread. Um, and we'll be able to tackle these topics as we move forward here. I'm gonna close the poll now. And I think, let's see. I think you can st now see my screen, right? People can see your screen, it says, excellent. Okay, let's move on. So you can't talk about hydraulics without talking about this guy. This is uh, Daniel Bernoulli. He is the man uh, credited with Bernoulli's equation, which is shown here. And um, interesting fact about Daniel Bernoulli, he was uh, born into a really prominent math and science family. This is Mr. Bernoulli here, his dad. Uh, young Daniel Bernoulli beat his dad in a science contest in Paris in the mid 1700s and uh, was promptly kicked out of the house because his dad was so embarrassed to be beaten in a science contest by his son. So it was it was tough love in the Bernoulli household. Um, but what uh, Bernoulli's innovation was, was he was able to take kind of some of the principles uh, of energy conservation and apply them to hydraulics. And so what he said was um, not taking friction into account, anywhere on a streamline, you're able to look at uh, a term that describes the velocity of the water. So this is uh, V squared is velocity squared over two. Uh, the height of the surface of the water, so in this case, Z is the height of the surface of the water, times gravity, um, plus the pressure of the water. Oh, this is any fluid. I'm talking about water because we're, we're talking about storm water here. The pressure of the water over, over the density, which might change with temperature, this remains constant anywhere on the streamline. And usually these terms are, ref are referred to as static head. So this is if, if the water is stopped this is the water level that's going to uh, occur at that spot and a velocity component or velocity head. So um, it, as, as the water is moving, this is the portion of the, of the total head of the system that is taken in velocity. And it's kind of a, a version of, of an energy uh, conservation equation. So this is, I'm gonna get into some math here and um, you know, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on this. Uh, obviously, this will be recorded. If you want to go back and look at my algebra, um, you can. If you have any questions to talk to me about, that's okay too. But I just wanted to describe a little bit about how Bernoulli's equation is used. If you imagine that this is a catch basin, let's say, at some kind of tank, um, but we'll, for the sake of simplicity, say that this is a static water level at the top here. It's um, water's coming in and, and the water level staying right here. And uh, so you're at steady state and you have a pipe coming out the bottom here. So we're gonna call this pipe down here We'll say this is an orifice, so we're calling it point O. And the top of the tank here is the top of the tank. We're going to call it point T. And um, what Bernoulli's equation says is if you take all these terms around point T, the, v, the velocity at T and the height at T, and you take all the terms at the, at the point of O here, down here, the velocity at O and the height at O, these are going to be equal because this is constant, this is hydraulically connected. Now, there are terms here that I can cancel because for example, we'll say that this is atmospheric pressure here and this is atmospheric pressure here and the water doesn't change temperature or density. So that's gonna be the same at either point. And so we'll, we can cancel those out, subtract that right out of the equation. And we can say here there's um, zero velocity at the top. So if we put in a zero for V squared, that can cancel out. 
and we'll call this bottom point here zero. This is gonna be our datum. And so we'll say that's zero, we can cross that out. And you end up with this equation right here, which is a very common and super convenient form of Bernoulli's equation, because you can just say, oh, the velocity down here, um, squared over 2g is going to give you the height of the water that's pushing down through this whole system. And so, you know, what I did here was I just introduced, I, I assigned um, a, a velocity of one meter per second. You can put that into this equation and you get a height at the top. So it's super convenient, really uh, straightforward to use. Now, some of you are going to look at that and go, uh, you know, I would use the Orphis equation for this. Uh, for this instance. And the Orphis equation is, is often uh, shown in this form. And, um, you know, same sort of terms here. You have, instead of Z, they call it H for the height of the water. But here is gravity. Uh, and then Q is the, is the volumetric flow coming out of this Orphis here. And in this case, A is the area of this Orphis. But there's a, a term here that, um, is, the, is a coefficient called the coefficient of discharge. And um, if you were just to drill a hole in the side of this tank, let's say, that is a sharp edged orifice. And that coefficient of discharge is shown kind of ex through experimentation to be around 0.6. But if that's a rounded orifice, now that takes uh, that coefficient of discharge and increases it to almost one. It, it can't get any bigger than one. One is as big as it gets. So um, th that means that it's a lot easier for the water to come out of this, out of this tank. Um, if you make this a little short tube, now there starts being a little bit of eddying that goes on in here. And it goes back, the coefficient of discharge goes back down to 0 0.8. And then worse of them all, if you took this, this tube and pushed it into the tank, then you know go down to 0.5. So you can see, you know, there's a, a range of different coefficient of discharges that go in here. The coefficient of discharge is just a way of adding friction to the system. And like we said, Bernoulli's uh, equation doesn't really take into account friction. And so when you add friction here, now I've done a bunch of uh, math here, but but, but the or the Orphis equation is just a special form of Bernoulli's equation. And, you know, I, I do some algebra, but as I do this algebra, you can see that I can get to the point where here I have my V squared over 2G, which is um, what we're looking at right here, V squared over 2G. So we've got our V squared over 2G times a constant, and that constant is 1 over C squared. 1 over c squared equals, I said at some point here, I subbed z for h. So um, uh, 1 over c squared is, in this form of the equation, a convenient way to, to look at it, so convenient that they give it a different name and they call it k. So what, k is just the coefficient, is 1 over the coefficient of discharge squared. And like we were saying, a coefficient of discharge, a common coefficient of discharge is 0.6. The corresponding k value would be right around 3. So that's the relationship between the coefficient of discharge and k. k value is, um, again, a super convenient way to talk about losses through a pipe network through friction. And if you have a, a manual like this, uh, somewhere in the appendix, there would be a list of all the different bends and T's and entrances and valves and things like this that um, have different K values and they would have different formulas for calculating the K value. And this is something that, you know, if you're designing a piping network in a building or something like that, uh, you're able to very easily look at the velocity through the pipe use the k value to come up with what the loss is and you end up with a pile of head losses and you can add those head losses up and you have the total loss through that pipe network so it's really convenient and and uh and, and people use this all the time um to to measure those losses it's so convenient that that is also what they use for 
municipal drainage systems, even though un unlike um, you know, designing a pipe network in a house, municipal drainage systems are not always running full. Uh, yeah, they're not always running full. So, you know, you might have areas in your drainage system that are pressure pipe uh, running full, but you are also going to have areas that are open channel flow. Still, often they, they use the K value as a shorthand and an, and an easy way to estimate these losses. So this is um, something I snipped from the Connecticut DOT drainage manual. And you can see here, they're talking about, here's our K times V squared over 2G. Um, and they're saying, well, you can use, for a K value, you can use a, a, an initial head loss coefficient that they are going to define for you times a pile of correction factors. And all these things came from empirical data that was pulled from a lab experiment uh, somewhere, and it ends up in um, this drainage manual. What, so they, they're talking about here uh, the initial head loss coefficient. Um, and, and how do they define that? With this uh, easy to use formula. You know, and it looks like this because all of these numbers are empirically derived. So somebody went in, did a bunch of lab experiments, and then found a curve that they could fit to it that uh, generalized the results. But in this case, it's essentially uh, they found a way to generalize the results that's based on the angle between the pipes. So pipes that are straight in and straight out are going to have a um, a lower K value than uh, something that takes a, a steep turn. Um, and then the ratio of the of the uh, outlet pipe to the structure diameter. And that's how you, you get the K value for, um, for this unit. Uh, this is the way the Connecticut DOT manual does it. Everybody has a different way to do it. Every uh, drainage manual is different. Some of them have tables. Some of them have equations. Um, you know, your, your your local area is going to have their own rules. Um, your local area might be Australia, and if it is, uh, you're, you're going to have. Uh, a similar approach, and this is from a, a manual in Australia. And you can see here they have a catch basin. Um, here's our K times V squared over 2G. Uh, it's how you generate that grade line here um, from a flow rate here. And they're talking about the velocity at this outlet. So you, you get the idea of, of how that how that works out. Um, the uh, they have a separate, and this is you know unique to Australia, but just to give you an idea about how things work around the world, they have a separate K value whether you're talking about a static water column in which all the velocity has been um, the velocity is zero, and so all of the energy has been converted to static head, uh, and then they have another one KU here for a situation where you have a pipe coming in and a pipe coming out, and there might be some conservation of velocity as the flow goes from one pipe to the other. So just, just a kind of a demonstration of how things look in other places. So this k-value approach is really um, uh, simple, and is because of that, you'll, you'll find it used by some manufacturers as a way to estimate head loss. And this is, uh, this is uh, a product um, that you might have run into. Uh, and the, the way that it's worded here is the head loss through this product is similar to that of a 60 degree bend structure. The applicable K value for calculating mining, minor losses through the unit is 1.1. And for submerged conditions, the applicable K value is three. So they give two different K values for kind of two different conditions, hydraulic conditions that the system might find. And that is a really kind of useful uh, simplification of the hydraulics within this, um, this hydrodynamic separator. But in practice, things can get a lot more complicated than that. And I wanted to show this chart. This is from a product that was um, 
you, you can find reports uh, summarizing the performance of products that have been certified by uh, NJDEP and uh, NJCAT, the Corporation for Advanced Technology, is the uh, test verification arm of the NJDEP approval. And they maintain a library of test reports, some of which contain uh, hydraulic characterization. So this is uh, an example of a hydraulic characterization that, that's in one of those reports. And you can see here, there's actually two pieces of information plotted on here. One is the total energy loss. So this is the loss of energy um, uh, both both the velocity head and the static head uh, total of that across the unit. You can see it kind of goes through a couple of different uh, control points. I'll explain this later, but it goes through a few different control points and changes its loss characteristics. Um, we just and also, I just want to characterize we we we. We talk about it like energy loss. It's measured in feet because it's sort of potential energy, but um, but but you often you'll hear people discuss it as as total energy loss or energy loss. But what I want to discuss here is this blue line is looking at a calculated coefficient of discharge based on the outlet pipe uh, area, um, the wet area of the outlet pipe. And so what you can see here is this is something that is changing over the course of um, as as the flow rate through the system changes, that coefficient of discharge changes too. And so while it's convenient and um, maybe appropriate from a shorthand standpoint to get a couple of discharges and say, well, it's around here when we're in this mode of operation and it's around here when we're in, in this mode of operation um it's probably not you you, you want to be careful if you're in a if you have a site where you have lots of hydraulic head and you just need a rough idea that's fine or if you just want to know maybe what the hydraulics are going to be at your 100 year storm so you're not uh, flooding upstream during a 100 year storm that might be fine but if you're in a situation where you really need to know the water level at all you know in this kind of a stage discharge sort of way um, working with the k value or a coefficient of discharge might not get you where you need to be. Uh, how are those curves like this generated? The, these sort of head discharge curves and coefficient of discharge curves for, for hydrodynamic separators. If you are somebody who is wants to specify um, a hydraulic curve with your um, for your separators or for your filters, um, it's worth knowing that the ASTM maintains a test method for both the separation of uh, hydrodynamic separators and a separate one for filters. Uh, so you can you can um, reference these in your specifications, and people can pull this information and uh, follow this as a set of guidelines. Uh, I'm on the committee that puts these together. I know that there, there's actually a new version of this, uh, of both of these protocols in the works right now, but it's not changing that much from the ones that are published at the moment. Also worth noting, there's one for screens in the works as well, so you can keep your eye open for that. Um, what that standard method describes is not rocket science by any means. It's just basically describing a lab test setup where you put uh, a hydrodynamic separator, let's say, in a laboratory, and you put flow in the inlet pipe, flow comes out the outlet pipe, you reach steady state, so you, you know you've got static water levels, and uh, you measure the water level in the inlet pipe, and you measure the water level in the outlet pipe. Because these water levels can be a little choppy and can be a little hard to read, the way that it's done is a pressure tap is put in the bottom of each one of these pipes. And um, you may have heard the phrase, water finds its own level. So these pressure taps are routed to a spot where they can be compared to one another and 
and compared to the datum of the of of the pipe, let's say the invert of the pipe. And so the water level in this tube is going to be roughly the average water level of the inlet pipe at this point, and and the same goes for the outlet pipe here. So you can compare these, run through several different uh, flow rates, and you have a hydraulic characterization for your for your separator. If you are interested in a size of product or a flow rate that won't fit in your laboratory or anyone's laboratory, um, then you might rely on something like computational fluid dynamics, which is uh, a way of running a simulation of fluid flow in a computer. Um, this is a two-phase simulation here called a volume of fluid uh, model, a VOF model, and it shows, sort of tracks the water level throughout the system. Uh, this is great if you have some time or a really powerful computer because CFD models um, are not fast and you know you, you it might take a week or more to uh, run a CFD model to get a steady state flow condition like this. So if you have the time or you have some really powerful computers, this is a kind of a nifty way to do it. If you have a basic computer, um, you can rely on hydraulic modeling software. And this is a screenshot from HydraCAD, which is a, a hydraulic modeling package that we use at Hydro a lot. Um, but there are several different ones out there that you might have encountered. And hydraulic modeling software relies on all of those theoretical um, uh, hydraulic calculations like Bernoulli's equation and like the Orfis equation, uh, like weir flow equations, and it does all of those for you. It sort of um, takes all of those equations and runs the numbers for you. So it's super convenient. It's super fast. Uh, you can run it on any old computer. I'm sure that many of you use this kind of software daily. But what's tricky about it is uh, it's going to ask you things like, what is your coefficient of discharge or what is your K value if you're talking about an orifice or you're talking about the loss of um, uh, you know a pipe going in and out of a structure. So what do you do? Um, at Hydro what we do is we try to use kind of a, a, a little bit of all of these things and, and one informs the other and so we use HydroCAD because it's fast and because it's uh, convenient, but we calibrate our coefficient of discharge and we calibrate our K value uh, at the low flows using our laboratory setup because um, we could run those low flows physically in our lab. And at the high flows, we use CFD to spot check a few, a few points. And that allows us to ensure that we have appropriate coefficient of discharge numbers and appropriate K values for uh, the HydroCAD model we're using. Some of you are going to be interested in um, doing hydraulic calculations yourself uh, by hand, even if. Um, it's just so that you have a sense of uh, that you know what's going on. And so what I want to do now is run through kind of an example of how Hydro International, our engineering team, does a hydraulic um, calculation in-house. And the simplest way for us to describe it is with our product. This is our hydrodynamic separator called the Downstream Defender. And it's it's really easy to calculate hydraulics on it for a couple of reasons. One, the inlet pipe, uh, there are no orifices within, within the device other than the pipe openings. So the inlet pipe opening, the outlet pipe opening, those are the only orifices in there. And the smaller of the two is the controlling orifice. So in this case, um, it's, it's often the inlet pipe with the way we design them. So, um, 
Uh, the other thing that makes this really simple to do hydraulic calculations on is we bring the inlet pipe in in a submerged condition. So the static water level in the unit is going to be at the invert of the outlet pipe, which is here, and we bring in the flow in the inlet pipe down here, so it's submerged, which is really convenient because you don't have to deal with open channel flow at all. And now your velocity term, so here's our V squared over 2G times K equals Z. Your velocity term, because this is a full pipe, is just going to be the flow rate through the pipe divided by the area of the pipe, and you end up with the velocity going through the pipe. Um, so that's super easy. In our laboratory and in our CFD, we have determined that the appropriate K value for the hydro for the downstream defender is uh, three. So you, you could use those numbers. And if you plug these numbers into this uh, version of Bernoulli's, you know, this kind of form of the hydraulics, you can get something like this. So it's um it's super convenient and uh and really easy to use. And just like you'd expect from a, a quadratic uh, relationship like this, if you were, if you were to plug in um, an orifice into HydroCAD, because this is essentially just an orifice with a K value, and you plug this in to HydroCAD, you'd get sort of a typical orifice, you know, quadratic curve like this. So no surprises. Now, what happens if you take the unit and you put it offline in an externally bypassed system? So in this case, uh, here's our downstream defender. This would be a diversion structure uh, with a weir in it. And so flow comes in here, encounters this weir, um, is directed to the downstream defender, gets treated, comes out the outlet pipe, goes into the downstream side of the weir, and leaves the system. And then at some point, the flow rate becomes high enough, let's say the storm intensity increases, and the flow rate becomes high enough that the water level begins to bypass over, over this weir here. So if you um, and this is a little bit of a simplification. The guys in our engineering department will put in losses for the entry to this pipe and the exit into this pipe and things like that. But broadly speaking, you can look at the downstream water level, uh, downstream of the weir. You can add the head loss through the downstream defender, which is just, um, I'm going back a couple of slides, this equation here. Uh, and if you had a certain flow rate at which you'd like this to bypass at, um, you know, use the area of the inlet pipe of the DD. Uh, you have a certain flow rate you want it to bypass at. In general, that's going to be your, your weir height. And, you know, it's going to adjust a little bit based on losses on the pipes here. But, but for the most part, that, that, that is uh, pretty close to where you're going to be. Now, what does that do for our stage discharge plot? Here's our just straight ahead downstream defender curve acting like an orifice, like that. Um, the uh, the what what it, I set this weir at a half a foot. So in this case, when it gets to a half a foot, now it starts going over this weir. And this is kind of a shift in control point where no the the hydraulics of the system is no longer being controlled by the downstream defender. It's really now being controlled by that weir flow. And and as a result, at five CFS, instead of having three and a half feet of head on the system, now you only have, you know, a little, let's call it three quarters of a foot of head. So uh, much lower head. But one thing that I want to point out here is it, bypass is not like some kind of um, switch that's flipped. It's not like all the flow is going to the downstream defender and then boom, all the flow is going to bypass. Uh, there's kind of a, a, a gradual transition 
from one to the other. And um, if you know, let's say you do some hydraulic calculations and you find out your upstream water level and you find and you know your downstream water level, you can calculate how much flow is going to the downstream defender uh, because the head loss from here to here, the head from downstream to upstream, that difference is going to drive how much flow is going through the downstream defender. So the treatment flow that's going through the downstream defender is going to be uh, a, a product of, of the difference between those two water levels. You can do this by hand. It's a, it's a lot more convenient to have HydroCAD do it for you. And so I put together a little model here. This is what HydroCAD looks like uh, behind the hood, um, where I'm going to ramp up the flow from uh, zero to 10 CFS. Uh, and we'll, we'll put it into this system. And then we're going to route flow to the downstream defender here. And then we're going to also monitor the bypass flow. And we'll see the flow going to the downstream defender in red and the bypass flow in blue. So if you look at the hydraulics report, this plot, this looks like what we saw before, essentially. You know, you've got your orifice flow and then it turns over into weir flow here. But this is what I wanted to point out here. Um, th this is net now, this is a, a change. We have flow rate in uh, on the y-axis here. And um, the flow, and, and so the flow is starting off, all of it is going to the downstream defender. There's no flow bypassed until right about here. So this is like a little bit less than three CFS. And at a little less than three CFS, you know, I still have the weir set at about a half a foot. Uh, at, at this point, now flow begins to bypass. But the flow bypassing is, is not that great. And it's ramping up, it's ramping up the flow to the downstream defender is still increasing, but at a lower rate. And it's not until almost, you know, 3.8 CFS or something like that. Now you have half the flow going to the DD, half the flow going to the, um, the over the bypass. So there's a period of transition from, you, you know, uh, 2.8 to 3.8 CFS in which it's it's uh, changing. And then from there, more and more flow is going over the bypass and uh, more, more and more flow is going over to the DD as well, but at a much lower rate. So, so now most of the flow is being bypassed. But there's a point at which, at which they're, they're, they're seeing equal flow. So just worth noting here. There's one other kind of side, side topic that I just want to address here. Uh, sometimes on a site, you, you're, you're juggling available head on the site versus your water quality goals. And I do want to point out that when you're bypassing, particularly when you're using a weir, the flow that's being bypassed is at the top of the water column. And, you know, this is a, a slide from um, Urban Drainage, which is a, a well-respected textbook by Butler and Davies. And they characterize what's going on in a sewer and how bed loads are transported and things like that. And what they say is, you know, the the flow, the the, the material at the bottom of, of, a, of a pipe, a drainage pipe, is this kind of loose, uh, coarse material. Um, but when you get to the top of the pipe, yes, it's floatables and it's uh, oils and things like that. And you might lose that when you bypass, but you're going to be sending most of your most polluted, heaviest um, sediment laden uh, flow to the treatment unit. So, you know, if you don't have a lot of head on site, bypass is, you know, can be considered a tool to allow you to keep some of your water quality goals uh, while still maintaining uh, usable head levels for your, for your drainage system. Finally, the most complicated, and this is why manufacturers are giving you um, head discharge tables uh, in detail, are, are these internally bypassed separators. And in this case, what 
what manufacturers do is take, you know, essentially this setup of an externally bypassed arrangement and move the bypass so that it's inside the same manhole as the uh, separator. And so this is our internally bypass separator. This is the first defense. And um, you can see it has a, a weir here that uh, bypass flows go over. And, um, you know, here's, here's a, a, a plot from HydroCAD to show a, a general view of what the shape of the, of the hydraulics curve is for that product. It's just like you'd expect. It looks like the ones that we looked at before. The difference is the area that you would use to generate a curve like this is not the area of a pipe because now these pipes are usually in some level of open channel flow and they're not the control point of the system. The control point of the system is usually some orifice within the system here. And in the case of the first defense, it's this little guy right here at the bottom of this uh, inlet chute, you know, five, this inlet chute here. This is the the control point. This is the area that you're, you know, that we use when we um, do our hydraulic calculations. And you, it's often a detail of product design that is kept proprietary amongst uh, manufacturers. And so, you know, that's why when you talk to a manufacturer, they would prefer to give you just stage discharge information because this this kind of information about the the geometry. Um, within their device is kind of part of their competitive advantage. So uh, when you have an internally bypassed separator, it's a lot more difficult for um, for you to work on that uh, work on those hydraulics on your own. Um, you, you know, you, you'll have to work pretty closely with the engineering team for wh whoever is manufacturing the product, and they're going to supply um, a stage discharge plot or a head discharge plot or something like this uh or or maybe maybe they'll say oh this is the curve for what happens post bypass um and and and, and uh supply uh head discharge for this part of the curve something like that but in general you'll have to lean on their engineering team one of these uh, fine gentlemen will help you out if you call Hydro International. They're doing the hydraulic calcs on these sort of things day in and day out, and uh, they'll they'll come to your rescue. I'm going to just say a few words uh, about filters. Uh, I've got maybe four more slides here. Um, filters are uh, come in all different shapes and sizes, and it's a little bit more difficult to generalize what's going on hydraulically, but I can give a few little things that uh, you can keep your eyes open for as you're discussing hydraulics in stormwater filters. One is, instead of using orifice equations in, in filters, you're more often talking about Darcy's law. Here's Henry Darcy, handsome guy. Um, he uses uh, a K value as well, but in this case, the K value is not um, is, is not friction through an orifice, but is permeability. And every media has its own K value that it reports its permeability. And uh, this is this is the way Darcy's law is written. It's it's sometimes a little more easy to use in this form. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here, other than to say this is not velocity, this is uh, viscosity. So you know it's a whole other animal. Um, but uh, all that to say, in a media-controlled uh, filter like this upflow filter here, this is Hydro's upflow filter with a media bed. This is uh, another filter on the market, also uses upward filtration. These are uh, governed by Darcy's law. Radial filters uh, are another kind of filter that you might encounter. And what's interesting about them is they treat flow from the outside to some sort of central um, duct here. And uh, 
and, and then route the flow out this way. And because of that, they usually have some sort of weir inside them or a siphon or something like this in which they have a minimum head, operating head. And they do that because it would do no good for low storm, low intensity storms to only be treated by the bottom of this filter. They want to distribute the water over the entire surface area of the filter. And so to do that, they have a, uh, a weir or a orifice or a, um, a elevated orifice like that or a siphon that will raise the water level right at the beginning of the storm, I'm showing it here in this HydroCAD report to, you know, let's say in this case, two and a half feet, and it won't even start passing flow until it gets there. And then once it gets there, now it's going to act like, you know, some sort of, it's, this is close. In reality, this is gonna be pretty much a straight line based on Darcy's law, and then obviously might hit a, a bypass curve and start, uh, weiring over some sort of bypass weir. So that's something to think about with, uh, with those filters. Finally, the thing about filters is while they might be governed by Darcy's law, they are highly impacted by occlusion. And what I mean by occlusion is clogging, material collecting on the surface of the filter. Um, if you go, this is a, a plot from a, uh, test report, again, from NJCAT on their website. Every filter that is approved has a, a chart like this that shows the sediment load that was introduced during the test. It actually is seeded in a laboratory test, seeded mass going into the inlet pipe, and what the driving head is for that filter. And you can see you have this curve that, if it's not exponential, it's certainly um, uh, kind of a quadratic uh, curve here. So um, while Darcy's law is important, at some point sediment takes over and, and, it, and the, head, the driving head goes up that way. Now, I just wanna point out one thing on here. You can see this is the, the, the test report for this product, which is another version of the upflow filter. And you can see that the driving head is going along, going along, and then all of a sudden it starts to increase. And then after run 27, uh, it goes back down. And now it's it's kind of been reset. Well, what's happening here? This, this product is designed to have a backwash reservoir at the very top. And after every storm event, or in this case, every laboratory test, it drops this water back down through the filters at a, at a velocity that clears off the surface of the filters. And so in this case, we were running the test at a certain concentration and we realized, oh, we need more backwashes. So we went back down to the, the minimum concentration that the test protocol allows, which is around 200 milligrams per liter, a real typical concentration for storm water. And you can see that the backwash is just keeps that filter chugging right along. And you know, it's not until you get here that the occlusion starts catching up with it. And we're able to um, you know, almost triple the amount of flow, uh, the, the amount of sediment that can be captured by this product. So this product is called the, the extended maintenance cartridge, the EMC version of the upflow filter. Um, and it's, it's, it's to help keep filter hydraulics under control. So we've reached the end of the presentation. Uh, a few conclusions for you here. Um, manufacturer supplied K values, really convenient. They are kind of a simplification of system hydraulics. So make sure that you understand when you're using that K value that you're, um, you're using it at the right point, you know, that you're not using a K value from bypass, uh, from bypass flow rates pre, in a pre-bypass condition or something like that. Um, but if you have some extra space on site and you just kind of want to get a rough idea, this is a real convenient way to do it. Uh, if you want a real clear picture of your hydraulics, you can always specify ASTM standards 
uh, that the system be tested to those, and and that's a a good um, general bedrock uh, test you can run. Bypass is not some kind of binary yes no thing. It is kind of a a, a switch that goes slowly from from uh, full treatment to to increased bypass. Um, it bypasses the cleanest water in the pipe first, so that could be useful for you. Uh, when it comes to filters, they often have a minimum driving head as well as a maximum driving head, so you're gonna watch out for that. And when you're talking about filters, the hydraulics of the system is more impacted by sediment load than the hydraulic load. So just a few, a few things for you to take away. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Um, there's going to be a survey coming your way after this webinar. If you take that survey, you will be in the, um, the drawing for a $50 Amazon gift card. Uh, we'll notify you if you want later this week, and uh, PDHs will be mailed out no later than tomorrow. And with that, this is again my contact information. Uh, if you have any questions or uh, want to contact me for anything, feel free to reach out. And um, that's it. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.